Okay, um, I'll kick off with introducing myself then. I'm John Snyders. I teach music performance at uh, Durham University and I run a new music ensemble in the Netherlands called the Ives Ensemble. And I've known Duncan for quite a while now and I can't even remember how long. And Duncan, who are you? Um, hi, yes, well, I'm Duncan McLeod. Uh, I'm a composer. Um, I am a lecturer in composition at the University of Nottingham, uh, where I've been teaching now for a couple of years or so. Um, and in terms of other activities, I'm involved in a little trio that we do some uh, electroacoustic works called Soundcart, um, as well as uh, running a concert series in Nottingham uh, called Not Noise. Um, yeah which uh, do take a look out for. We're doing some really exciting things in the next month or so. Very good, thank you. So this talk will be about a piece of yours called The Metalization of a Dream. And um, of course, if a piece isn't called simply piece or sonata or symphony, um, we should get some idea of what the title stands for and what it means. So. Uh, could you elaborate a bit about uh, what metalization of a dream is? Sure, sure. Um, so metalization of a dream is actually a book that was uh, published uh, by the artist Eduardo Polozzi as a Scots uh, artist. Um, and uh, in short, the title is, is kind of a reference to the um, influence of, of this piece, namely uh, Polozzi's use of collage. Um, the, the book itself is, is actually a monogram looking at his um, early works um, and outputs. Uh, and in terms of meaning for the text, it's, I guess, one could say it's nonsense. I mean, um, in as much that Polozzi not only worked in collage uh, or utilized collage techniques, um, in ways than other than the visual, so would take uh, found texts and do cut up so and so forth, and from that uh, find kind of I guess found poetry. So having these these really quite poetic phrases. Um, so that's that's the well, that's where the title comes from. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so if you listen to the piece, one thing you have to be acutely aware of is that what you are hearing is not necessarily the version of the piece it's a version of the piece so every subsequent performance could be quite different in its outcome <clears throat> uh, length and any other kind of uh, uh, quality so uh, could you uh, tell me something about how the piece works and why it works like that Sure. Um, so the piece itself is actually a collection of smaller works. Um, I guess one could call them, in some respects, miniatures um, that are uh, scored for open notation. So the instrumentation is, is open um, and it's uh, freely fitting to the ensemble. Could you ask the question again, John? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I... Let it <laughs> No, 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 that's, that's all fine. So listening to uh, the piece in any given concert uh, does not mean you have listened to the definitive version of the piece because the piece can be wildly different from one performance to the next. So how does the piece work in that respect? Sure. Um, so the piece itself is, I guess, what you would term as open form. So um, rather than having a fully notated score, uh, the work is actually comprised of uh, a dozen or so uh, smaller individual discrete works in which the uh, performers, the ensemble, uh, choose which of those works they wish to perform, the order of which again is their decision to be made. Um, and as such, you have, in essence, what one would describe as, as almost a aleatoric structure. So alia meaning kind of rolling up the dice. Um, and I mean, for me, it's this, dare I say, relinquishing a degree of control to, to the performer to kind of look at how they construct the work um, and indeed adapt that for each performance situation and scenario. So the couple of times this, this piece has been 
performed in one instance the the program only allowed a, a 10 minute performance as such the ensemble the galvanized ensemble um, in this case um were well they they chose the relevant sections decided amongst themselves the order of that indeed some of these materials can be uh, overlaid in fact that's very much encouraged um as such one is able to kind of make a, a i guess you could argue a, an, an almost bespoke performance from uh, performance to performance where it isn't necessarily the case that once you've done all the movements you are completely done with the piece so you could repeat stuff oh absolutely you do them in different configurations uh, so does the piece have a kind of you think a kind of minimum and maximum length or could it go on for you know <laughs> yes. eternity, so, so to speak <laughs> well no i think i've I mean, the couple of times the work has been performed so far, I would err on kind of, I think for me, the minimum is generally around eight to nine minutes. And that's partly attributed to the fact that some of the, the kind of discrete uh, pieces of work in themselves, if they're played um, in, in isolation, would be about four, four or five minutes. Um, I think the the longest version of this piece so far was actually done in its premiere at the Littonville in Newcastle. Um, and that came in, I think, a little under half an hour. And for me, that seemed, uh, uh, was, was a very different experience of the piece to a uh, performance that was um, done at City University in uh, January of this year, pre-COVID. Um, and yeah, I mean, in that instance, it was half, half that time. And I think for me, the impression of their work was, 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 was very different. So. I think there's, I guess in answer to your question, there's, there's no optimum kind of length, um, uh, or indeed there isn't kind of, the sh there isn't a, oh, how to put it, kind of, oh, sorry. <laughs> There isn't, an, there isn't an ideal length for the piece. Yes, but... yeah, yeah, that's, and it's, and I think for me that's, has been really quite interesting in, in creating the work is, is that, for me, it's, well, I had to put this, I think when, when I normally approach composition, I have kind of a clear idea of the structure of the, the piece. Everything is kind of fully notated and give or take some fluctuations in tempo. There's an expectation or, or um, a, a vision, dare I say, of, of kind of the duration of that work. I think what I find actually quite exciting about this particular work is that um, through, through firstly relinquishing control, but also taking a very different approach to the, the structure that it is free and it's, it's open but I find it really fascinating to see what the performers take take from those materials um, and with that the the kind of the um, varied interpretations of the work and that's interpretation beyond what you would expect in a fully notated work where in in most works you're kind of indicating timbre um, dynamic shape so and so forth in this in this instance um, I, I've, in many respects, very deliberately left things quite open. So certain works, for instance, intentionally do not contain any dynamic markings. Um, and that for me is in recognition of the fact that when the ensemble is performing this work, if they choose that work, they may be juxtaposing that against another uh, section or piece uh, from within the collection. As such, the, I guess it's kind of a having, or dare I say, future-proofing it in as much that one has to be uh, able to kind of adapt these materials ever so slightly so that they can kind of exist against one another. Yes, and in that respect, you don't mind um, giving over control of a large part of your piece to the performers? No, I mean, I think for me, and indeed I should probably say that the, the commission, so the commission came about, um, through, I was approached by uh, Kate Halsall from Galvanize Ensemble, um, and it's a, a series that Galvanize have been working for a number of years called Happenstance, where they've commissioned a number of composers to uh, compose works that are, well, not necessarily wholly free and open form structure, but it was very much recognition of the ensemble themselves. They're a, a very diverse uh, instrumentation. You have guitar, electric guitar, uh, piano, vocals, percussion, and electronics but also a number of galvanized projects uh, included this including this particular piece uh, we'll see them work and collaborate 
uh, with other ensembles such as Fretwork, um, who were involved in the uh, premiere of, of uh, this this work. As such, um, I in, it, it was it was part of the commission to to have this degree of I guess flexibility or, or space to change, manipulate, and indeed invite um, improvised elements. And that's, and that's a component in some of the discrete uh, pieces within the, the collection or catalog of works that make up the Methylizers of the Dream. Yes. So in a way, it is related to what someone like uh, uh, John Cage proposed to do in the series of, of pieces. Well, actually, a piece called Music Circus, which is uh, uh, a lot broader because he allows material from anywhere and anything to be juxtaposed in any way whatsoever. Now, of course, you're, you have provided all the material uh, uh, for your piece yourself. You don't want pe people to come up with their own music necessarily, <laughs> even though the material itself uh, uh, to some degree, relies on found objects, found materials. So could you say um, uh, what those materials are and why you chose the materials uh, uh, specifically and what their role is in, uh, uh, get in, in doing this piece in this particular way? Sure. Um, so I think, first of all, it's interesting you say about the, the John Cage work. That was actually... A, a key influence behind this work um, in my formative years and as, as an undergraduate uh, in uh, Baspa University, um, the Michael Tippett Center had a quite substantial overhaul. There's a very formal launch and part of that saw a performance of Cage's Music Circus. Um, and for me, I was really struck for the first time as to how one can approach uh com well composing it's it's it i think for me it it really challenged this this notion of um uh going to a concert performance as being within an auditorium and that there's this kind of hierarchy at play performers on platform audience sat and behaving in a very particular way you stand up you clap you move in in yes there's a right and ritual dare i say around performance and for me it was just a real um, eye-opener to be involved in this performance music circus where the audience is invited to uh, navigate the space as they please. There isn't a sweet spot, dare I say, an optimum position to be sat. If a performer wants to um, go and listen to a, a, a discrete piece within the collection of works, they can sit very close by that performer indeed, stay for the second performance of that discrete section. Um, but similarly, I think it, for me, it's, I was really drawn to the fact that one can enable the listener to take a more aut autonomous approach to their experience of the work. And indeed, there is no, dare I say, optimum experience of the piece, that ev everyone's, dare I say, takeaway from that performance was very different because of the very virtue of the um, architecture of the, of, of, of the space uh, in which this was performed and to be clear here um, the performance in Bath saw uh, some performers within the concert hall, some were in corridors, some were outside. Um, yeah it's really yeah a lot of fun. So um, I think in, in terms of uh, this, this particular piece, um, what was the question John? <laughs> the question was uh, about your use of found material uh, in in this piece, basically, not uh, making your uh, piece from scratch, but starting with something that already exists. Sure. Uh, which, of course, is also part of the 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 kind of music circus thing. Even though you then go on and uh, make the found objects into your own uh, into your own music, instead of just leaving them be. Sure. So what kind of found objects did you use for this piece and why did you choose those specific things? So I think for me, in terms of the found objects, there there are a couple of things at play. So some of them are pre-existing works. So um, for example, uh, I have a, um, or rather the Inomine, um, uh, melody, which is actually uh, composed by John Tavener in the early 1500s. And the Anonyme is a, um, 
a cantus firmus line, I guess you would say, that uh, featured in Taverner's uh, Mass Gloria Tibli Trinitas. Um, and for me, what what drew me to this particular material was the, was the fact that it became, I guess, a kind of musical meme that there were a, a great number of other composers, uh, co contemporaries of, of Taverner and indeed later generations indeed today that have taken that um, melodic line and then kind of reworked and made their own. So, um, in fact, throughout this piece, there are a number of these discrete, smaller um, pieces or movements, I guess for want of a better word, that are actually drawing upon the pitch material in some shape or form. So that was kind of one found uh, object. Um, other uh, objects that uh, kind of fascinated me and kind of linking in with the the inspiration for the work in, in terms of working with this kind of sense of collage um, was the work of uh, Gertrude Stein, American uh, writer. Um, and for me, I think what I've 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 long uh, admired Stein's uh, writing. I mean, it's very it is it's very it's very idiosyncratic. Um, very playful and repetitive um, and often has kind of a, a play on words and kind of the double meanings and through that repetition you're, you're, you, you start out by, by reading and listening to this text and then by the end of it it's like is that or was she meaning and it's this I think for me the ambiguity the and, and also moments of the absurd where it's kind of did, did did that poem actually just say that? Was that was 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 that an intentional thing? Was that a trick? So um, I think for me, and indeed throughout this uh, particular piece, there's there's fragments of, of Stein's poetry, which for me, um, I should probably say that although I was familiar with her work, it was actually an exhibition at Dundee Contemporary Arts, uh, what must have been about two or three years ago, with the American artist Eve Fowler, who draws upon Stein's writing a great deal. Um, I, I was just immediately struck by, dare I say, this kind of similarities in Gertrude Stein's writing, just in as much that um, as Palozzi works with visual collage, uh, the same could be said in terms of Gertrude Stein's writing. It's, it's kind of, she, she is, there is collage at play, words are being broken up, there's sometimes there's very simple repetitions of a word, but she'll even go further to syllables. Um, and I guess, dare I say, for me, the similarities there that she's often utilising these collage techniques, utilising her own material. So it's not found material, it's kind of taking her text and then, dare I say, cutting up of sorts. Um, in terms of kind of other resources that, or, or materials found sounds uh, that feature, and I guess set found sounds being the optimal word here is, or term rather, um, is the, I guess what one could refer to as the acoustic ecology that features in the work, that being recordings of various environments. Um, and for me, this was a, a, a means to kind of respond to the um, location in which each version of this piece is performed. So that uh, kind of uh, appears in, 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 in two forms. The first form is uh, one of the uh, discrete uh, pieces um, within Metalization of the Dream is in fact a text score and it's instruction to um, an individual, uh, ideally someone who perhaps is, is kind of doing electronics, there's the option to have electronics with this work as you'll will hear within the recording. So the instruction within that is to ultimately tune into local radio stations and kind of play around and, and, and capture um, some of those, those, those sounds and to me that's 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 really quite interesting. It's been interesting going from performance to performance, whereby you'll have some very kind of topical, um, uh, political points kind of touched upon COVID, Brexit, for instance, um, but also some some quite amusing regional aspects. I mean, there was um, uh, the the first performance up in in, in Newcastle where we tune into a, a local talk talk radio station where they're kind of debating um, licensing hours. And so it's, yeah, it, it, it brings it its own kind of quirk and it's, it's a sense of place to the performance. So rather than it, it being this, um, dare I say, a, obviously not a, a carbon repeat of the work, but it, it just, I guess, brings a, I guess, a, a personal um, geographical kind of marker to the, the work. 
Um, and in the same vein, um, there's also instruction to uh, the electronics, dare I say, whoever's realizing the electronics, um, to capture sounds from uh, the environment in which the work is to be performed. So the idea is that on the day of performance or the day running up to, um, one, one would go out into the in, in environment and then kind of capture and record those. Now, I've taken some artistic license in terms of the performance that we are uh, broadcasting uh, online um, in as much that when I was working on the, the mix of this work, I was uh, very fortunate to have a artist residency at the Red House of Britain Piers in Aldborough. So what features um, in, in this particular performance is uh, sounds that were very much kind of around me during the time of this two weeks residency. So we have um, various recordings taken at the beach at Aldborough. Um, in addition to that, there were these spectacular trees that uh, on a very blustery day, um, it was quite a challenge trying to record without picking up wind sound, but I managed it. Um, you get these kind of fantastic white noise effects. And similarly, the, uh, those of you that are familiar with um, the, the coast of Aldborough, there's quite a few uh, reed beds. And those in themselves produce some very, very beautiful kind of sonorous uh, white, white noise, dare I say. Um, and also within that, there were some spectacular thunderstorms, um, which in itself I found really quite fascinating to kind of draw upon the, uh, the acoustic of, of rain falling on. Um, there's a, a great deal of shale in, in, in Albury. It isn't a sandy beach, it's a, a, a shale beach, a stony beach. Um, and with that, just the, 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 the kind of textures there. And for me, kind of thinking back at my, my time that I was on the residency, it's, it, it's, it's those sounds that, that for me kind of fed into my experience of, of that place. Um, and I think coming, coming back to the work in itself and the underlying principles and the, dare I say, the thing that inspired me is, is this idea that one can bring together quite disparate um, sound sources. Um, and in doing so, I'm not attempting to project a meaning. I'm, if anything, I'm, I'm wanting to invite the listener to, or, or th those, if we're lucky enough to do it live again, um, can, can, can take from the performance their own interpretation, its own meaning, so on and so forth. I mean, one um, individual who listened to the work recently, um, and, and quite interestingly, and quite understandably, kind of drew, drew upon the title, The Metalization of a Dream, and is kind of thinking of these quite um, abstract connections and kind of actually how, how dreamlike these things are. So perhaps coming back to your very first question, it was an intentional choice of title. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, that's the, uh, the story as it were with regards to the, the found sounds and materials. And then of course, uh, using them in a kind of collage technique way, you said um, is also inspired by Eduardo Paolozzi. Yes who in his earlier work definitely um, very much used collage techniques. It was one of the first in Britain, kind of the precursors to, uh, uh, to the whole pop art movement that yeah. people like Peter Blake uh, yes. later, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, brought to new heights, so to speak. Um, in what way do you think think, uh, if I look at Paolozzi's um, uh, earlier works, and, and specifically the collage works, they are incredibly garish, quite a lot of them. Yes. Very wild in, in coloration and in kind of in your face. Your piece is, at least the version that I have heard, is less so. Yes. But, of course, you don't need to sound like um the inspiration that you that you took your uh, <laughs> uh, your ideas from but could you say a bit about how Paolozzi's working methods if they did uh, um, uh, filtered through in in your piece or was it just the the idea of using collage in that way i think in some respects it's a bit of both i mean I had, I, yeah, I think in my initial ideas and, and kind of trialing ideas for this particular piece, one thing that became quite apparent is um, having, how I guess, 
what would be quite strident, very bold musical material being uh, performed simultaneously, um, that there's a, a very real danger of it kind of being a very muddy texture and it can be very difficult to kind of hear and perceive these things. And I think through the research and development of the work, it became clear quite quickly um, that one has to exercise a degree of restraint. <laughs> <laughs> um, that said, that's not to say that there aren't materials that are perhaps more kind of brash in their material. There's there's one section that is um, in some ways kind of a, a, a deconstruction of a Inomine melody utilising a ring modulated piano, um, which gives a very kind of brash, a, a very beautiful, almost kind of metallic um, quality to it. Um, and I, I found with that that there's yeah there's there's there's, there's some things that I guess could potentially um, I get has has the potential to kind of upset and de um, unbalance things and that's not necessarily a bad thing within the, the case of this work um, but I think coming back to um, the the version that, that that we have today I think. Uh, this this um, shorter version being 16 minutes, I think now um, that will the, the the kind of choice of materials there was was very much kind of a, a decision made by myself to kind of make that dynamic balance. Um, and again, just to kind of follow on from that, it's also in recognition of the format that this is being performed. So, um, in an ideal scenario, and indeed the intention for this work is to be presented. It, as a, I guess, a promenade, which is a term some people might be familiar with, where performers are distributed about the space. As such, you have that kind of very strident, very, um, uh, very distinct material uh, being performed, rhythmically dis distinct. And if they're playing simultaneously, if there's sufficient space between them, that's they 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 oddly complement one another. However, the moment that you bring these things together, and this is where we're, we're dealing a little bit with psychoacoustics, where they're occupying a very, very contained space as we encounter with a, a stereo mix, for instance. Um, I, I found it most certainly when I was putting together early mixes of, of this particular piece and, and selecting material, it became very clear that actually bringing these things, these, these um, very, how to put, distinct characters <laughs> <laughs> together um, there was a it just overcrowded things so I think in in terms of as we hear the the piece with regards the the video that um, the artist Claire Orm has created for this work um, I was very kind of careful in dare I say the kind of curation of the materials that said I think in terms of doing this this work live in a um, open space um, yeah there's 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 a lot more kind of room and scope to be a bit more loud and brash with the materials. But second to that, I think, and, and coming back to your point about um, drawing upon Palozzi's uh, collage techniques, yes, I think where one may think of Palozzi, I think those of uh, those those individuals that are familiar with his work, he was um, he had a great passion for jazz music. So um, jazz, I think, featured quite heavily um, in his kind of day to day listening. Uh, in fact. Uh, London Jazz Festival, which I think sadly is now defunct, but for a number of years their poster was always um, routinely designed and created by uh, Palozzi, um, the Soho Jazz Festival in fact. Um, but what I found quite interesting on doing some further reading around uh, Palozzi's work is that he was also very much influenced by Charles Ives. Um, and there's in fact a collection of collage works, the name of which uh, sadly escapes me, but they're actually responses to um, a, a, a important, well, what Palozzi deemed as kind of important 20th century works within which there's uh, one collage in response to the unanswered question. Um, and in a roundabout way, I think, for me, I, I can see some potential synergies in the metalization of the dream in terms of how one treats musical material with Ives unanswered question, with those those three layers of material that kind of exist against one another, that admittedly, I think is it the um, uh, the brass line kind of being more um, strident um, against this kind of very smooth legato string section. And it's it's those 
it's it's those um oh there's a a, a phrase uh, john cage coined the coexistence of the similars that by bringing these these three arguably quite disparate things together um one takes from it an uh, an additional meaning which it, i think comes back to what polozzi is doing with his collages is that you're you're taking there's one collage where it's a, a magazine clipping of a boot um, and against that is just some kind of torn paper and so kind of forming these very bringing together these these very disparate materials but by kind of combining these things together through occupying the same space um, yeah I think I, I'm just really fascinated by Palazzi kind of inviting the viewer to kind of take and almost kind of project their own meaning to to what they're seeing and indeed hearing thank you yeah that's very interesting that's an interesting view an interesting uh, idea i mean of course uh, um, there is a huge difference between collages in visual arts and collages in music in that collages in visual arts always remain on the same flat surface yes and you can always see the whole thing the whole composition whereas of course in music it's it's so time-based that the whole idea of collage is superimposition quite mm. often um, but you can never hear the whole piece in one go so you always have to think very differently about uh, about these things and and uh, still uh, the the idea even though in visual effect Paolozzi's collages are radically different from from yours you do understand that they come from the same kind of 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 thinking process in a way no absolutely um, right i think we might have covered <laughs> these in some depth <laughs> john thank you so much that's it's much appreciated <laughs>